What's up, Sales Hacker community? Thank you all for joining us. So, huge webinar today. We've had almost 2,000 people register for this one. So, pretty crazy. Uh, we appreciate the support uh, from the whole community. So, welcome to another Sales Hacker webinar. My name is Scott Barker, uh, Head of Partnerships at Sales Hacker. Uh, we've got a great topic to chat about today, and the topic is SDRs, how to follow up without being a stalker. And now before I introduce my guest, uh, I want to take care of a few housekeeping matters. Uh, we will be recording this session, and it will be available afterwards. Uh, in case you need to jump off or you want to share it out with a colleague, uh, as you know or may not know, uh, we do like to be as interactive as possible. So with this in mind, uh, please feel free to go to the chat feature, introduce yourself, name, title, company, size of your sales team. Uh, our panelists definitely want to hear from you. So please ask questions as we go through the webinar. Uh, for this webinar, we will be answering relevant questions throughout, and then we'll have a little Q&A session at the end as well, and we'll try and fit in as many as possible. So now that we have that out of the way, uh, I'd like to introduce our awesome, awesome guest presenter. Uh, I'm joined by Manny, the co-founder and CEO of Outreach. Manny, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for, for having me. I'm, uh, and thanks for everybody who signed up. I'm overwhelmed with the uh, reception and the, um, the amount of people who want to uh, hear the story of how do, we, how do we as SDRs become more relevant in other people's life if we try and do our job day to day. I love it. Yeah, we're so lucky to have you. And so I dove into your background a little bit, and I want to give just some context uh, for the listeners and the attendees out there. Uh, so you founded Outreach in 2014, and prior to that, you were employee number three on Amazon's AWS team. And you also led the Microsoft mobile division from launch to 50 million in annual rev. Uh, more than that, you hold an MBA from Harvard and a master's in computer science from the University of Pennsylvania. And I've also been lucky enough to talk to some of your employees and, you know, they say across the board uh, that you really are a model of, you know, a vulnerable and transparent uh, leader, which is really cool. Uh, they told me a few things. I understand you still send out a, a weekly email uh, from the heart uh, to your employees. Uh, and every Friday, the whole organization gets together uh, to share their highs and then also the lows. Uh, of the week, which I found really interesting. Uh, in addition, uh, you are a big proponent of saving the planet uh, by consuming less and purchasing secondhand whenever possible. Uh, there are some rumors floating around there that uh, you take center stage at in industry uh, events uh, wearing clothes from Goodwill. And uh, you grew up in Ecuador and now live with your wife and three children in Seattle. So. Very, very impressive background. Uh, super humbled to be on this webinar with you, Manny. Uh, but uh, before we dive into it, is the Goodwill rumor true? Uh, it, it is. And actually, I got yelled at uh, at home uh, by my wife for letting out on that secret because she doesn't want to <laughs> take the good shirts. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. We, uh, we should all be following your lead on that one for sure. Well, without further ado, uh, Manny, do you want to kick us off? Let's dive into it. Well, thank you for having me again, and, and thanks everybody for for participating. Uh, uh, as, as as you mentioned, uh, I'm this um, the the co-founder and CEO of Outreach. There is three other uh, co-founders with me, and the story of Outreach, which many um, in, the, in this uh, webinar may have heard, but we started really early and. Outreach is a pivot from another company, and we pivoted for two reasons. One is we had to we as as part of our previous company, which was in the recruiting space, we were running out of cash, and we tried to sell our way out of it. And and being four engineers as the co-founder of the company, we decided to build an we engineered a workflow to literally code our way out of the problem. And the workflow had to do with how do we increase the number of meetings that we would have because meetings, as we all know, is precursor to revenue. And we built the internal version of outreach, and as we were booking meetings, people were more interested in what 
the tool that we used to get into that meeting was rather than the product that we were selling. And that's what we had the aha moment of pivoting the company away from the recruiting services into pure software play uh, for recruiting workflow, sorry, for sales workflow. And, and that was the genesis of outreach. The, the, the part that is relevant to this group is that because we were still small and just booking revenue and as a pivot, it's really hard to raise. Um, we hire a small sales team and the sales team consisted of my current VP of sales, Mark Kosaglo, and a small group of his friends who joined us, but they were, they were commission only sales reps. So for wow. me to make their time worthwhile, I had to make sure that each of them had four, at least four meetings per day and it was five of them. So that's 20 meetings per day for them to be able to make enough money for them to support themselves on a commission only model. So I became the first SDR for them because I, my, their time was way more valuable closing. And I always thought that opening a door is more difficult than closing a deal. So I used outreach for, to, to fund ourselves our all, all the way to our first um, investment and all the way to the first million dollars of, of revenue. And I was, the, I was the first inbound and outbound. Actually, we had a no outbound, so it was the first outbound SDR. And I used outreach for that. And... That is the reason why I'm so passionate about this subject. That is the reason why I always speak up um, whenever I see, you know, some uh, the, the lack of empathy being thrown the way of SDRs because SDR is A, a really hard job, and B, is the soul of every sales organization. And you call it many different names, um, but I literally just got off having breakfast with Steve Wolski, who is uh, the founder and, and CEO of PTC, and in his mind, a good rep prospects. And that's what an SDR does. He prospects on behalf of their on behalf of their aides. So, I'm I'm definitely a, a, a champion for the for for the for the career. Um, I, I I love my SDRs. I support them very much, and it's something that I, I try to instill in every CEO that I meet. Uh, that this is sort of the heart and soul of every uh, sales organization. I so love that. that, and I think uh, yeah, I think sorry, just to jump in, I think you're definitely speaking. Uh, the language of a lot of our uh, attendees out there, uh, I find it amazing that you can you know, really, really relate to you know, the SDR function because you have been hustling you know, every day in the trenches, booking up to 20 meetings a day. Uh, I have to ask, were you a, uh, a phone, a social, or an email guy for your first touch? You know, there's that ongoing debate. That's a great. That's a great. That's a great question. So I I just started as an as an email only guy mostly because it's easy. It's hard. It's, it's expensive to buy a list of phones. It's way mm -hmm. cheaper to get emails to find a list of emails. And the 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 thing about outreach though is that it makes that argument scientific quick. Meaning, I I started with hypothesis that email was going to be the thing that opened the door. But as outreach started garnering more more and more users. Um, I came across a gentleman by the name of Jason Vargas, who was at that point the, the lead of the SDR director at Datanize. And he was running a sequence on outreach that had 50% reply rates. That is five zero reply rates, meaning one out of, out of every two emails who get replied. And wow. the that we use internally is about 20% of those replies are yeses, and 80% of those replies are either no's or objections. So both of which you can deal with at some degree, and we'll get into that in a minute, but the yeses move directly to meetings. So you will get a, 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 the, 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 the amount of meetings that he was able to generate you know, with 20% or 50 so 10% of email, of email will be yeses, will be meetings. That is huge. So, and I dug into it, and I called him, like, so how do you do it? And he always used a social step, meaning he will visit somebody's LinkedIn, comment on a, on a, on a, on a, on a note, leave him a note, send him a request, do something, something social, and that alone boosted his email productivity three to four X. So that changed my, my perspective. Now, those steps are also expensive because it requires a human to sort of go out and make a connection and, and do a bunch of work. So you have to sort of measure the effectiveness of that step. But uh, to, to answer your question, I am now a, a big fan and a proponent of making it social first and then email later. Um, so that you can start getting yourself into the mind of the buyer. So you can get into the sort of what is he thinking, what is he looking like, what is his background or her background, so you can start sort of getting to it. That, Absolutely. That's like yeah, no, that's a, that's a great answer. And, you know, working in tandem with, with social and then it can give you 
you know the the information that you need to actually craft that email outreach much better. That's, That's awesome. right. You get to measure. That's sort of the bottom line. Make sure that you whatever you use that you're measuring the results that you're getting. Both how much time is it consuming and what results are you getting out of it. So because if you're if you're meeting if you're if you're using that social step and meeting at the, it may be booking a meeting with somebody who's not a decision maker or somebody who's not going to help you get the deal across, then you just wasted time. But if you're using right. that social step to, to, to book you know somebody with a BP title, a decision maker or a buyer, then then it's it's definitely worthwhile. So you have to be able to you have to measure it. It's sort of the short of it. Don't don't take anything with religion or, or conviction until you measure it yourself and how it works in your own environment. So with that, couldn't agree me, more. Yeah. Let me move on to um, the 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 opening statement here in that in that there's a, there's a fine line between hunting and harassing, and and and, and it's a fine line. It's a it's a it's a quintessential human thought and activity. And, and if it wasn't hard, it would have been automated already, and it would probably be automated by our reach by now. Uh, and the reason we haven't automated it is because trying to figure out how much is too much is, is fundamentally a human condition that depends on how you're doing it, what are you using to do it, and who the recipient of that is, and what is his or her tolerance for the kind of behavior that you're using. And, and there's no, no simple way to go through it other than just go through it. Um, it's kind of like dating in a sense, in that it really depends on the, on, on, it takes two to tango, if you would. Absolutely. Lots of external factors going on that you can't necessarily control. That's right. Um, it, was, it was Carl Jung that said that when two humans meet, both of them suffer a, a chemical change. Meaning there is a reaction from each of them interacting with each other. And what you're trying to figure out is, what is that reaction? Interesting. So the first thing, the first tip is, and in, in it's sort of one of the, the mindset that, that, I, that I encourage all SDRs to take on as they're starting their job is that of a doctor. And, and, I, and I got this from, from Weinberg, uh, Weinberg's book, uh, Sell Simplified, in that I approach every single one of my, of my sales as I'm, I'm solving a problem that either they do know they have or they don't know they have. And, and a doctor sort of does the same thing. If, if you sort of are able to diagnose a pain, you know, right around your stomach, on the upper part of your stomach, and it's very sharp, and then the question is, do you, is, is that gas or an appendicitis? And, and either of them have a degree of complexity and a degree of, um, and, and, and the outcome could be, you know, from, from, from anywhere from pain to death. And your job is to get to the bottom of it quickly. And when you approach your job with that mentality, it changes completely because you're not, you're not selling anything. You're out there saving the world. And that's, that's why I encourage everybody to go there, to, to go out and, and believe that what they're selling is true, is true innovation. In our case, for instance, we sell revenue efficiency. And when I, when I pump up the troops in my own shop, I tell them, look, without revenue efficiency, Funds don't make it back to innovation. And if funds don't make it back to innovation, then innovation doesn't get funded, and then companies slow down, people have to lay off. So we are out there making sure that, in, that, that revenue is efficiently flowing from engineering to product to sales and back to engineering so that you can continually fund innovation. Um, and that's sort of what, they, they, again, the advice that I, that I give um, any new SDR or even my own SDR shop is that is that the first thing you need to do is truly work for a company that you believe the product is making a positive change in the world. That you, ha you have to take that as a prerequisite for your job. And I know that's a prerequisite for any job, and that you should, you know, there's a lot of advice out there of thinking of your own job as an investment, and it is true. But especially for SDRs, when your job is to convince somebody else to take a meeting so that they can hear what you have to say and how it's gonna change your life in a positive way. So the example that we gave is that of a shoe person, it's a, it's a shoe salesperson, is that if you see somebody walking in the wrong pair of shoes, either because they're ill-fitting or they're worn out or they have a hole or they're not the right shoe for the right person, and you notice that, it is almost the human imperative. It's your moral, it's your moral uh, uh, commitment and, and contract to go and tell that person that you have a solution for them. And, and if that is the way that you approach your job, you're never selling, you're always helping. You're always saving. You're always moving the ball forward for a bigger cause, if that makes any sense. 
That makes total sense. I think it's an excellent point, you know, just making that that switch in your mind that there is there are people out there that are, you know, suffering without your your product and your solution and you're the only one or your your team is the only one that has in your mind the the solution that can fix it. That's, that's exactly awesome. right. And that gives you and that sort of gives you the 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 the, 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 the that gives you license to to go and 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 be persistent, because if you're convinced and somebody else has pain, you won't let it go in your mind until you're into in, in, until a that person convinces you otherwise, or b you sort of get him get him in front of a potential solution to that pain. So now the the yeah. obvious requisite is that you have to work for a company that for which you believe in the product. For which you not, for you fundamentally understand what you're selling and believe that the product will solve the, the customer's problem, and that is it sounds like a small and obvious task, but is but it's not small and it's not obvious. Meaning, you, as an SDR, even though your job is to is to open a door for somebody else or perhaps do a qual, you know do a discovery call or do or, or sort of qualify a customer, you have to understand what you're selling, and I cannot stress this enough. If if it's a technical if a technically complex product, don't see your job as just pushing that door open. Your job is to understand that you're solving the problem, and it will not only will help you in your career, but it will help you in your mindset as you're thinking about how you open that door and what is potentially hurting that customer or what would hurt that customer in the future. Absolutely, I you know understanding and believing in your product is is massive. But I, I have a quick question just. Uh, so for some of those listeners that we have, you know, we get VPs of sales, CEOs, all the way down to brand new BDRs uh, who are maybe just, you know, fresh out of college, out of university, and may not have the luxury to pick and choose, you know, which company that they land with. Yeah. Um, so what do you suggest they do? Should they be honing their craft until they have more options? Should they be holding out for that perfect opportunity? Do you have any suggestions for people at a crossroads? That's a that's a great question. So, um, first of all, everybody everybody should be honing their craft at all times, irrespective of this is your first job out of college or your or you're a seasoned SDR and even an SDR manager. You should always have a beginner's mentality. And if you the most successful sales reps are those who who see this as a as a craft, they're constantly improving, that they're constantly um, observing how to get better, measuring it, um, and they sort of take it like a, like a, like an athlete, in, in that in that they're not. There's no end to how better can they get. So, if nothing else, that should be a constant in your development. Pick a, a pick a career that you're gonna you increasingly get better at it. But B, it's, in SDRs in particular, there's so many aspects of an SDR job that you can you know take each of those and so and, and get very good at it. Not not only your 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 how you open up a conversation, your phone um, skills, your research skills, time yourself, see how quickly can you research and figure somebody out, um, personalization on email, and how do you play a social game? How do you combine your steps? How do you measure your effectiveness? All those things are things that you can do in absence of um, uh, in, in 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 any job. Now it will be far easier to do it in a job for that you really truly believe the company, the mission, and the product. But short of that, you're you're absolutely right. Just get good at your craft. Now I, I want to push back on the concept of of oh you take a job because you're fresh out of college but you don't believe in the product. Um, if you don't believe in the product, I, I know this may sound you know uh, impractical, but don't don't take the job. Do something else until you find the right, the right job. Taking Taking a job that you're going to last a few months and you're never going to get the full juice out of it, it will be detrimental in the long term. So take find find something that you truly believe in that at least get your, you're bought into what management philosophy is of, 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 of trying to get to the customer. But don't don't make shortcuts. Um, do 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 try to find the thing that is that is that is your calling and as close as as it can to your convictions and go for that. Don't sacrifice that. That's it's your time, your investment. It that's the only thing that you have in life is time. Amazing, love that answer. One, uh, I'm definitely stealing that uh, that quote. Always have a beginner's mentality. It's a good good way to look at business and life. That's right. Um, so 
The second thing, the tip that I want to give is that is I hear this a lot, and I hear this a lot from 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 prominent people in social media, and I hear this a lot from from uh, from people in the speaking circles, and it sort of goes along the lines of send them a gift, be be human, compliment them with something early, and connect on, on whatever level you can. There's a fine line between kitsch and being and having a real connection. If somebody sends me a box of something and I don't know anything about this person or their product, they just wasted a box of something. You send me a bottle of champagne and, and you expect me to return that call, you just make me feel worse because I have no idea why am I receiving this. Now I'm, I'm compromised um, in terms of what should I do with it. I can't, should, I can't, should I give it away? Can I, I can't drink it. I don't even know what this person is. Like it's a, sort of create all these limiting beliefs in, 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 the, in the recipient of that. So make sure that whatever you use that is a, to, to cre it create a real connection. Do your research. Be re genuinely curious. Most, I've seen uh, things that are more relevant, such as I, I remember a rep from, from ADP a long time ago sent me a book about uh, uh, managing, uh, you, you know, building out, building out the management team. And the book was highlighted, and it had sticky notes on it with his comments on the, on the side saying, hey, I know you're a new CEO and I think these things will be relevant to you. That was hyper relevant. That got me directly in my heart because that was exactly the kind of thing that I'm thinking about. On the other hand, I've seen a guy reach out to me, you know, very, very genuinely, not in, not in a disingenuous kind of way, sort of commenting about my, you know, my, my, um, uh, my, my, my my taste for bulletproof coffee, which you know, I've been I've been drinking bulletproof coffee for a handful of years, um, and that's great. But that's not something I I, I want to talk about. I'm not an evangelist of bulletproof. I don't work for bulletproof. I just happen to like it, and I mentioned it in a blog a while ago. Um, and so that that won't go anywhere because that's not that's not relevant to me. So yes, you made a connection. Yes, you did your research. I, I, I don't I don't feel like I need to pay you back for that time. I need to pay you back for the time in which you found a problem and a connection for me. And, and that makes a real difference. So I'm going to talk in the, in the next slide um, about sort of how do you get there? How do you, how do you create uh, th those genuine connections? So one of the things that helped me early on, um, especially when I was SDRing for, for Marketing's team, for the, for, the, for the A's that were on commission, is, is usually, if nothing else, since I'm calling sales leaders, the majority of them, if nothing else, I will call them and ask for advice. And the, and, the, and the question will go like this. I'm a new CEO or I'm a new leader. You're a seasoned leader. And I would love to, to get some time on your calendar to talk about the problems that, that, you, that you experience in growing as a leader. Now, the reason for that question is both, right? I am actually genuinely curious about that question. And B, by talking about the things that they have experienced in, in, their, in their leadership path of growth, we will get to talk shop about the things that are relevant to him right now or to, her, or to that person right now. So I will get to get, I get advice and I get discovery for free, if that makes any sense. Meaning by, by talking about a topic that is both relevant to both of us, I get to A, compliment that person for, for not calling him out as a leader, but I also get to find out what are the pressing issues of his team and his company right at that point in time. Now you can say, well, you can do that because you're the CEO. Well, as it turns out, it applies to, to many different levels. Because if you're an SDR calling onto a VP or a, or a CXO, you can, make, you can use the line of like, look, I'm, a, I'm a starting my career and I want to know what's relevant in your, in your, in, in your, um, in your shop. What happens, um, what, kind of things, what kind of things are worrying you right now? So that, use a combination of that advice seeking, complimenting. Um, that will sort of help you open some doors for people who are genuinely interested in advising you. That doesn't excuse you from, from doing research, but this is sort of one of those lines that has helped me, and I've seen I've helped many, many other people who are starting their SDR career, is to sort of go out and ask for advice. That's awesome. I uh, never actually thought of it that way, and it's a great way to you know, get them speaking about something they're passionate about and kind of take them out of their traditional mindset of kind of shutting down when they get uh, a cold email or a cold call. I That's like exactly. It. Um, the, the one that I like the most, um, especially for enterprise um, or companies who are sort of hunting in the enterprise world, 
is that if you're if you are if the if the companies you're after are public or have um, comparable companies or sister companies um, that are public, then there, here's a quick tip. So public companies have something called the 10 Qs and 10 Ks, which are the quarterly reports and the and the annual reports that they have to publish. They have to they're a public and b they're they're you can easily find them on SEC gov and in those and those are big tones with a lot of numbers and a lot of paragraphs etc but one quick way to get up to speed not only about an industry but also about a company and the quick five top things that any management team is thinking about in the company is going to a section called management discussion and analysis mdna for short so management discussion and analysis has the best thinking from the company's management about their market, their position in the market, and their current problems. It is their job to make sure that they are in that they are educating investors around what they're getting into and the kind of risks they're about to face. So because it's so transparent, it sort of is a quick way for you in five minutes to get up to speed up to any market, any company, any management team, and have a quality conversation if you get a hold of their CXO of VPs or directors, or even be thoughtful and deliberate when you're writing that email and reaching out to them. I cannot stress this enough. This is the best way to get to get some high level thinking quickly and immediately send your team to, to have quality conversations with any executive or director or leader of that company because you found out quickly about their market, their landscape, and the things that they're struggling with in, in one quick read. So that is by far the most useful area for you to get information about a particular company and have a very high quality conversation. Wow. Yeah, I've been in sales a long time and I, I've never known about this. Can you say the website again where you can find them? So is the S is the uh, Securities Exchange Commission is the SEC that gov. Yep. And then you're looking for either the 10K or the 10Q of the company that you're researching. And those are the document types. Once you find the document, then go look, do a search in the document for a section called Management Discussion and Analysis. And it's somewhere in the middle. It's usually, you know, chapter seven or so of that whole 10Q or 10K. And it's usually a couple of paragraphs describing exactly what the company is going through and what kind of market condition they're in and what is management worried about because they're communicating to investors and prospective investors about all the risks that company is dealing with right now. So this is the closest you're going to get to op cracking open the head of a CEO and the entire leadership team and looking as to what exactly <laughs> there is no better way. Yeah, hopefully everyone out there is taking some notes on that. I know I am for sure. Uh, you know, if you're looking at ways how you can differentiate yourself from your your competition, if you're in a competitive market, well, you know, as you said, you get basically the CEO's brain uh, on paper, uh, so you can definitely speak their language. You know, if you're doing any ABM strategies, reaching out to certain uh, companies, doing a full strategy, uh, make sure you include this in, in your research to help you with your, your messaging. This is great, very cool. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, no, absolutely. The, the, this is it's, it's so rich in information and it's so relevant because it's exactly what management is thinking about, is what the board is hon holding the company accountable to, that it's almost unfair that it's public. So use it, take advantage of it, make it yours, read it in your spare time. It will only make you smarter. So to, to, to sort of wrap up my presentation and start taking some questions, um, I leave you with a few parting thoughts. So the first one is, is this is supposed to be hard. And as the noise in the market increases, as, as there's more emails and more advertising and more retargeting and more videos and things and, 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 and the messaging gets out there and you get bombarded with information, this will get harder. So your ability to cracking open that door will, be, will become more and more relevant over time. And again, this is a human-to-human -human communication problem. If it was easy, somebody would have automated it, and probably average would have automated it already. And it's not. 
It's not automated. It is a it is a job that is uniquely suited to a human, but it's also something that you get better with time, with practice, with deliberate practice, and with a lot of measuring. So think yourself as an athlete and break down your job into its finest components and then get good at each of those components individually. It's your craft. Take it and own it. The second thing is, I, I communicated this from the point of view in that SDRs, again, because they have the hardest jobs, is the blood of our organization. Whenever we do an exec review, which we do every week, the first one to present is always the SDR organization. Because if the SDR organization sneezes, everybody gets a cold and we miss our number. So for me, SDRs is sort of where it begins. And I call them the dandelions because they are able to blossom by using a little crack in the cement where there is a little patch of dirt and right there they're able to sprout deep roots and blossom into, into a flower. So it's, it's one of my favorite analogies. That's, that's a great analogy. I like that one. Again, I've uh, stolen a few good quotes from this. Uh... <laughs> and, and the last thing is that it's unfair that they, they uh, that SDR sort of get seen as a, as a low wrong job or um, as, as, as sort of a, a beginning job in, into any organization. It is sort of a, you know, very, very entry level, but you think about it, there is many other professions in which the SDR function exists, they just call it something else. So for instance, large um, venture capital or even funds have rooms full of what they call associates. These associates are making calls to prospective companies that they're going to find out the next, you know, Facebook to where to deploy their cash. So the ability to call somebody cold and, and make a value proposition that is important and life-changing is something that is extrapolated away from sales and into many, other, into many other realms. So even if you don't like what you're selling right now and you, or you don't like to sell a particular thing, you can quickly pivot your career and go and, you know, into investment management, for instance. You can, you can sell bonds. You can sell annuities. You can sell funding. There's all sorts of things that you can that you can sort of bring solutions to. So look at your you look at whatever your job is right now as an SDR, sort of as a stepping stone in a much broader landscape of careers, where the ability to crack open a door for a for to solve a problem is incredibly a rewarding and it's incredibly important. And and I want to conclude with with sort of um, uh, a word of encouragement for all the SDRs out there. You know, I'm seeing a lot of Lately, I'm seeing a lot of SDRs getting called out on LinkedIn or getting grilled or getting their emails or calls exposed or emails to management or CEOs exposing the SDRs for X, Y, or Z behavior. And I think that's, that's just wrong. If you don't, if you don't, if you don't like, uh, you know, the, 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 the heart of, 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 of the, 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 the environment that we live in, in, in capitalism is done when, when tra people transact with each other. And SERs are there to do exactly that, to make sure that they bring the right product to market and get in front of you and explain it to you in a way that is consumable. And it's a hard job, it's a necessary job, and most people have their jobs because an SDR continues to sustain a company. So just think about the, the hardness of the job and try to develop some empathy for it. There is a, there is a human on the other, si the other side of that email, and that human will use your feedback. So don't just you know flail him and 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 put him out to to um, for everybody to laugh or criticize. Try to help. Put yourself in the shoes. Develop a little empathy. We're all trying to do our job and earn a decent buck and build and build a career. So please just do your part. That's a great point. And Manny, I have a, I have a question on that because it can be a hard job. It can seem not fair uh, at times. Uh, at outreach, just to bring it back to some like actionable things that you know some of the leaders out there can implement. Uh, how do you keep your SDRs in a positive mindset? That's a that's a great question. So um, let me break that down in a couple of things. So first of all, it's really hard to have somebody with a negative mindset turn into a positive mindset. So positive mindset is something we hire for. If you don't have it, like if you're, if you're going through some things in your life or it's, if you're not quite there yet, it's really hard for a company that is on a, that, that is on a, on a revenue per employee optimization 
line, which every company in the planet is, to hire that person and turn that person around. So the, my best advice is, is to the, figure out a way to develop your own your own positive mindset. You know, read self-help books, go to webinars, educate yourself, find find friends, coaches, mentors that help you develop that that positive mindset to help you find your true north and sort of like develop it. Um, it for us, it's, it's one of our hiring criteria that you come in with a positive mindset. It's really, there are two things that, that, that you can manufacture. One is energy and the other one is mindset. So we need both of them coming into the job. So we interview and we, we, we scream for that. So once we have that person, then the question is, how do you maintain that positive mindset in despite setbacks, despite no's, despite missing um, your number, despite you know falling falling off your production line. Um, and that is where that is where leadership and management comes in, right? So we spend at Outreach we spend quality time coaching our coaches to make sure that they have a a, a, a tool belt of of approaches to bring to to our to our SER floor. So each of the SER leaders um, first of all, they they come from the SDR lines, meaning they have cred as an SDR, so they can coach another SDR on how to turn something around. The second thing is that we really encourage uh, breaking down the job and sort of training and 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 training for excellence in each of those parts of the job. So if it's research, if it's writing emails, if it's getting on the phone, if it's leaving voicemail, each of those things require a skill that we, we try to develop and coach to it so that put together in the aggregate make you a much better athlete. And and it's, it's hard not to have a positive, positive mindset when you're winning. So what we're trained you to do is how to win more and more often. And that will help you maintain your positive mindset in, 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 in the face of, of pushback or in the face of objection. That, that makes sense? sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I think uh, some of the points there where you, you mentioned, you know, focus on yourself first and foremost because that is, you know, the one thing that you can control. And then by doing so, you know, you'll look around and find that you're typically in a room with other positive people. Um, right. And then, the other advice that I have on that, and, and sorry, this just occurred to me, is yeah, uh, you maintain a positive mindset. There is three stages of winning. So first of all, when you win yourself. And that gives you some amount of lift and motivation in your, in your, in your outlook and how you do it. But it, that is short-lived. You, you get a lot more mileage when your team wins. You see? So when, you are, when you're a winner in a winning team, your positive mindset and your, and your demeanor will, be far, will, will have a lot more juice for a lot longer than if you just win yourself in a team of mediocrity or losing. So that's one advice for career choices is that as you're interviewing a company, make sure that you interview the team you're going to be part of. Make sure that there's, that is a winning team because you're going to succeed way easier in a winning team than in a losing team. And the third thing is when the company wins, meaning if you're in a winning, if, you're a, if, if you are a high performer in a winning team but the company's not doing so well, then people will leave and then you'll get back to square one. So make sure that you're vetting for all the things that you're looking for a job is that you are part of that you are yourself, consider yourself a winner, and you are in part of a team that, that is striving to win and for excellence, that is part of a company that is striving to win and to excel, and is winning, by the way. That's a great breakdown. So just three, look, make sure that you are winning, and then make sure your team, your department is winning, and then look broader lens even further to, to the company. Uh, and that's how you'll find sustained. That's, that's a recipe for a great career. You will see those years of your life like nothing else. Absolutely. So early than everybody else, work longer, think about your job harder, get better at it because of that constant reinforcement, not only from your own team, but from your own company. Great. Awesome. And yeah, as we kind of wrap up the presentation here, we have a ton of questions. So they're, they've kind of been popping in throughout and uh, there were so many that I kind of just kept them, uh, kept them primarily to the end here. So we've left them a good amount of time for questions, so we'll dive into it here. Um, but yeah, if anyone has questions, comments, uh, you know, here is uh, Manny's LinkedIn as well as his Twitter. And then if you want to learn uh, any more about outreach, um, there's that email uh, there as well. Um, and okay, so before I go to some of the questions, 
I, I think it's safe to say most of our listeners. Sorry, yeah, go, ahead. go ahead. No, I was going to say, feel uh, free to cover questions on LinkedIn or just, you know, pop them up on Twitter. I'm not, not a super social guy, but I, I do spend quite a bit of time on LinkedIn, so you'll find me there. Perfect. Um, and yeah, so I think most of our listeners probably have heard of outreach. I'm going to assume that. But for those who maybe haven't, uh, how does outreach help sales professionals? Yeah, absolutely. So outreach is a sales engagement platform that allows your each of your reps to perform like your best rep, meaning we take your sales process and we put it into a sequence of pieces of workflow that allows the rep to perform faster, better, and usually get 3x productivity lift from whatever, from whatever your sales motion is. So it doesn't matter if you're SMB or your account base or your persona base, we'll map your, the workflow to outreach and automate a lot of the pieces that need to be automated so that your reps can continue to kill it on the, on the areas that, that is needed. Love it. Okay, jumping to some questions from the audience. So we have one here from Enna Man, and this is seemingly around sort of objection handling in the SDR position. And Enna wants to know, um, how about when a buyer already has a product? Uh, she is in IT services, so it's a competitive industry, and you're not necessarily unique or the first one on the market. Uh, how can you handle that uh, situation? Tough question. That is a tough question, um, especially because, so there's two ways to approach it, right? One is the fact that they have a product doesn't mean that they're happy. And very few people will admit that they're unhappy with the current product unless you probe. Uh, mostly because if you found the buyer and that person bought the, 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 the unhappy product, they will be the last to admit it. So um, it's tricky in that, in that you may not have time to do all this, but my recommendation is to A, acknowledge that they do have the product and say, you know, I'm glad that you do. I'm, and and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, and then use that as a way to confirm that the pain points you're going to resolve are being resolved by the current product. So if you're selling IT services and you're bringing down the total cost of ownership or you're bringing down um, cycle time on development or you're bringing down you know, maintenance of, of a particular legacy piece of software or infrastructure, are you still getting, are you getting that value out of the current customer? And you're not asking because you want him to switch, you're asking because you're genuinely interested. Meaning your solution does that will that customer have the problem in the future? Because if the answer is, you know, we're just started, give me some time to do it, that means that they do have that problem. You see what I mean? You just got confirmation that, that they're a qualified customer. The second thing you want to know is by when can you go back? Meaning when does the contract expire? When should we have in this conversation? And if your enablement team did, did, did good work, then you should have your five talking points that are features that, 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 that map to, uh, to your competitive environment that make you different than the current solution. So you can bring those up in when the deal is up and you can get back into the door. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's it, right? And it's always shocking to me when, uh, you know, someone gets a, you know, sorry, we already have a solution. And it doesn't mean that it's a never, right? There is an expiry date on that contract that they have. So, you know, if it's not a right time with that, just make a note. And that means it's an opportunity for you, you know, six months down the line or a, a year down the line, whatever it is, you know, have that patience. And, uh, yeah, that's exactly right. But the most thing is, yeah, is go use ahead. that answer, to use that, that sort of like crack in the door to confirm that your associated pain and features and benefits exist at that company. You see what I mean? Because that you get the so you're gonna get a no, but at least you got a qualification event out of that. You see what I mean? So now you have a qualified account that just happened to be deploying a competing product. So now, now for you, it's just a matter of timing it for when the contract is up. And continue Absolutely. to advocate, continue to stay engage. Yeah, and I think yeah, again, like you said, any piece of information or or data that you can extrapolate from them from that conversation. It's just going to help you in the future, and then also when you go up against other organizations that are maybe with the same vendor, you know, it can help you, you know, build out a set of battle cards or 
know, you got to look at other small wins that you can do and not just focus on the opportunity there. That's exactly right. Awesome. Okay. Uh, here is another, I hope that was a, a good answer to your, to your question uh, there, Anna. Um, and I got another one here from John Loyla. Um, so this was uh, regarding when you um, gave the tip to ask for advice. And John wants to know, um, if they happen to bring up a pain point that your product solves, uh, do you set the appointment right away or do you continue to build rapport uh, and set the meeting after the call, after they've given you all their advice, this executive that you called? Who, who asked that question? This was John. John Lola. Uh, I think, John, you know the answer to that. You continue to build rapport and you get... You don't end the question. You don't end the conversation right there and then. You, you, if, if you genuinely call to ask for advice, just bottom it out. Get all the advice you can, and you can will, and you will, you will get that meeting for free. So why not capture all the value you can from that conversation? Hundred percent agree. Uh, next question we have from uh, Jimmy Church. This is regarding the awesome uh, tip you gave regarding the SEC. Uh, and John, or sorry, Jimmy wants to know who who typically at an organization contributes to the 10K. Uh, he said he used this method, uh, and not all of them necessarily contribute to that. Do you know who that is? Is it just the, the C-suite, or so? The, so the 10K um, is usually put together by the finance team, but the finance team is a service organization to the rest of the organization. So they have to go around and ask everybody. You know, what are your risks? What are we what are we seeing in market? Where are we getting gummed up? Where are we seeing growth? What's in the product pipeline? So because it's done by finance and finance has to over has to oversee everything in the company, it's done by the sort of the most functional and cross functional team in the organization as a whole. And it then it gets distilled in a number of risks that is the top of mind for the so the, the 10K, the management discussion and analysis from the 10K is literally the CEO's marching orders. If he does nothing else, he does that. And if he doesn't do that, the board will fire him or her. So it's contributed by a bunch of different departments, depending on the risk and the cost and whatever. But at the end of the day, those are the, the things that are top of mind for the CEO. If you have, if you have, so if you have a, a solution, make sure that you find a way to map it to one of those problems listed on the CEOs in, on, the, on the management discussion and analysis. Because it will be relevant. You know, because they all, the, if, if you think about this, every function in the organization is, is, is there to support a particular goal. That goal is dictated in that, in that section of the, the, the 10K. Awesome. And yeah, we've got a ton of interest in that, uh, that tip that you gave uh, about the 10K. We've got about almost 10 questions here just asking. Uh, I know we did repeat this once, but do you mind uh, walking through it one more time, Manny, just uh, the the uh, the website and how you can find the 10k. Yeah, it's called sec.gov, and in the SEC, there is a search box where you can put the name of the company. If it's a public company, then they have the obligation to submit a 10k and a 10q. And the 10q comes out quarterly, which is very fresh, and you can use that to 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 take a peek and what's top of mind right now. Or the 10k comes out annually, which sort of paints broad strokes what's happening to the company at, at, at the higher level. So read both, but the 10K is a sweet, short, quick tidbit of information. So you open it and it's, it's gonna open in several formats. So you can either download it as a PDF or you can open it as a web page. And it's gonna look overwhelming. There's a lot of legalese, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of charts, there's a lot of stuff in it that, that, it, that is not relevant to your job. So immediately go and search for this, this word, management, discussion, and analysis. And that will bring you to a section that is called by most bankers the MDNA section, Management, Discussion, and Analysis. And that will have usually a page, if not a few paragraphs, that tells you in, in a very short and sweet what is this company about and what environment are they, are they, are they, are they do they have to contend? What is, the, what is the competitive dynamics of their environment and what are the top priorities for that company to go solve? Great. Yeah. Thanks for uh, thanks for your patience running through that that one final time for us. Uh, yeah. It's awesome and valuable. 
Um, okay, moving on to the next question. We've got one here uh, from Chris Hartvigson, uh, who I actually know. I believe he's the CEO and founder of Julie AI. So hello, Chris. <laughs> he wanted to know, um, in a crowded marketplace uh, like Sales Tool, you know, where outreach plays in, uh, how do you handle the objection or how do your SDRs handle the objection of too many tools, uh, we can't bring on anything else? Uh, that that's easy. So if if you did a good job um, mapping mapping sort of if you did a good job elevating your feature and the associated benefit, then you should be able to raise above the crowd. So the the reason why the landscape is crowded is because there's a lot of single you know single point solutions out there, things that do one thing, right? They do calendaring appointments, or they do uh, power dialing, or they do um, email template management, or they do uh, lead scoring, or they do routing, or that kind of thing. So there's a lot of, and, and because there's a lot of them that do this, this one single thing, so people tend to build stacks. So this is why you hear about the term sell stack. Um, and, and then when you talk to, to, to leaders, they want to sort of fit you into that stack. And, and what you need to do as a, as a, as a vendor is, is figure out what is your unique what is it, what you need to elevate the, the set of capabilities that you have so that so that it has an associated benefit that has a proportionate high ROI, and that's sort of when it gets interesting, right? So for us, you know, when we go sell, like there's no shop in the world that doesn't want more meetings. There's no shop in the world that doesn't believe that the rep productivity is low. Matter of fact, if you look at the majority of studies out there, you see that rep participation is going down over time. Meaning, do you need more reps to hit the same amount of revenue? So that is a trend that is general, right? Like the question is, how is that a trend affecting you and how is that listed in the priorities of things that you're trying to do? So for your market, go figure out what is that trend? What is that sort of seminal trend that you, and, and how do you elevate your current set of capabilities to something that solves a problem that when you compare the, not this, the, the problem solved versus in the future that you're trying to bring that company to versus the current state, you cannot unsee it. I mean, that's that's the art of sales, right? When you paint a future that is so vivid and so bright and so different from what it is right now that you have to get off of status quo and go and close that. The hardest thing to sell against is not competition, it's a status quo. Absolutely. Like when you, you, get, you, know, of, get, your, you get your... You get a lot of, of, oh, you know, we bought these 50 things this year. Are you getting any lift? If you're talking to me right now, that means that you bought 50 things and you got zero lift out of those 50 things that you bought. So you haven't gotten lift. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of like, you know, when, when you're able to paint that picture, if you're going on, you know, an amazing vacation, that's all you can think about. And then it somehow gets, you know, taken away, you're going to do everything in your power to, you know, still go on that vacation, right? So it's, it's about painting that picture so that they're burning the bridges behind them. But they can't even see their business process uh, without your your tool uh, anymore. That's precisely right. And, and it's funny that you said, you know, you, you, you burn sort of the bridge or the ships or whatever the proverbial, uh, you know, move is. But that, that is your job as a salesperson is to create certainty of the future that you want to be, you want your customer to believe, that you want to establish. Mm -hmm. And that, this is why it's magical, right? Because the moment you create certainty, your customer cannot see the world the same way anymore because they know that it's an alternative and they can't have it until they buy your thing. That's my magic. Why I love sales. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. That's why we're in it. Um, awesome. Okay, so we have time for a few more questions. Um, and thank you so much for, for giving so much insight here, Manny. So uh, we have Marcus Lampley. Uh, would like to know, what do you think is the quickest way to personalize uh, reaching out to someone? Um, we talked about, of course, a few things. Here today, so, but I see that question a lot, and, and and sort of let me let me let me let me sort of get on my on my soapbox here. Your job is not to personalize. Your job is to get a a a, a productive meeting. So, and the problem with setting the question the way you said it is that you can get you, if you send somebody a joke, you will get a response, especially if it's a good joke. <laughs> Do you move the ball forward? No. Yes, you made a connection, but you didn't move the ball forward. You you wasted a cycle for unproductive for an unproductive activity. 
So what you're trying to optimize is what is the what is the quickest way to get a meeting if you're an SER? What is the quickest way to get a, a to 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 get somebody qualified? And you can do a lot of research up front to figure out whether the company is a good fit or not, and then sort of come to the table with the most relevant guess or the most so with your best guess of what is the most burning pro problem at the company and how you affect that problem. And that's it. This is, this is one of the reasons I, I'm pretty passionate about the subject and I, I'm pretty loud is that there's a lot of bad advice of being kitchen, being personal, and this is just a misnomer for laziness. We need to solve problems. We're getting paid to solve problems. Let's not turn this into uh, 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 a contest of you know, who can be the most human. That is, that is not the point. The point is, can you solve the customer's problem? Can you get to the bottom of the problem of the customer's problem quickly? Yeah, that's great. Uh, so basically, you know, personalization, not for just the sake of personalization, that you know, you know, their favorite uh, cup of coffee and how they like it, but personalization through the lens of the pain and the challenges that these people are seeing uh, in their day-to-day -day job. Again, for my own view, like I had somebody found out through a blog that I that I love Bulletproof Coffee, and that person reached out to me with exactly that and saying, hey, I like Bulletproof Coffee too, and how, how is that going to change my life? How is, gonna, how is that going to affect the 10 problems that I'm facing right now? So that, that, was, that, that was a great point of connection, but I can't, like, I don't have time to answer those kinds of emails. Right. That makes yeah. sense. Uh, Somebody comes and tells me, look, I can help you lower your AWS bill. I'm all ears. I have a lot of time for you. You see what I mean? So the, right. you, you have to sort of get to understand what is that, what is that as, a, as, a, as, a, as an executive, what's top of mind for you. Right. Yeah. So relevant personalization is, is key. Right. Um, Okay, so I think we have time for one more question. Uh, so Temi from Cisco Systems, uh, I'm a brand new SCR, and I was wondering what are some day-to-day -day practices that you see uh, from your best SCRs at Outreach? That's a great question. That, uh, yeah. That's a great question. So my best SDRs show up early. They're in before anybody else is in. And they come in, and they plan their day meticulously to make sure they understand who they're going to be calling, who they're going to be emailing, and what are the results. And they envision the results they want to get before the end is over, the day is over. My best SDRs have very set morning routines. Their morning routine is usually something that sets them up for winning. They plan their day around hitting the goals that they set for themselves. They all follow the, the, the playbook, and then once they have mastered the playbook, they optimize on top of what they know, and they become even better. So my best SDRs get promoted within, you know, I don't know, I think, I think the last two got promoted within nine months. Wow. Because they, were, they hit the number you know, right, right on target, and, and, and they're so good at what they do that now I want them to teach other SDRs how to do what they do. Amazing. So that was show up early, plan meticulously, envision the results that you want for the day, make sure that you're setting a morning routine, sticking with it, plan your day around your goals and results, follow the playbook, and then iterate and optimize. That's right. Amazing, amazing tips. That's awesome. All right, well that takes us to the top of the hour, Manny. Thank you so much for your time. That was uh, fantastic. Appreciate all of the insight. Well, thank you, and thanks for the, uh, the, uh, the, the people who showed up. Hopefully I uh, added some value to our day, and there's some actionable things they can go and do right now. Absolutely. Yes, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, your time and attendance is uh, appreciated, and hope to see a ton of you at uh, Revenue Summit coming up in March. Thanks a lot. Thank you.